Among the animal kingdom, chimpanzees have an unexpected propensity for violence, which can be shockingly lethal when directed at humans. The seemingly docile chimpanzee combines mighty strength and agility in the wild. Adult male chimpanzees are three times stronger than humans and have sharp, powerful teeth. When a chimpanzee decides to attack, it may unleash a torrent of brutality, targeting weak areas like the face or limbs with the intent to incapacitate and kill. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we will present three of the most brutal chimpanzee attacks on humans ever recorded. Welcome to Wild Assault. <laughs> Jerome and Sandra Harold were a devoted couple living in Stamford, Connecticut. They were a lovely family with only one daughter, Susan. Susan, soon married, eloped with her husband, and their once bustling and lively home fell silent on October 24, 2003. The lonely couple grew tired of boredom and purchased a three-day-old chimp for $50,000. The chimp, named Travis after Sandra's favorite country music star, Travis Tritt, lived with the couple. The couple bathed Travis, bottle-fed him, dressed him, and brushed his teeth. The couple loved and cared for the chimp, and treated it as their surrogate. Travis brought a new purpose and vibrancy to the home, and kept the couple busy. After their daughter's departure, Travis grew up and began to understand the language of his human parents. The couple had to renovate their home to accommodate the burgeoning chimpanzee. They built a large room for Travis to play around in and hung tires and ropes. While the couple ran other errands, Travis was always busy swinging and jumping on the bed couch. At the dinner table, Travis sat and held a stemmed wine glass. He ate with his family. The couple really spoiled him. Soon, everyone in Stamford knew him. Neighbors and police waved to Travis whenever they saw him. His friendly personality won out. He won the hearts of the residents and quickly became a local celebrity. He could dress himself, feed hay to his horses, open locked doors with his key, and water his plants. He strove to master his wondrous skills. He loved baseball and mastered watching TV and using the remote control. The chimpanzee could even boot up the family computer, log in and view photos. He had a weakness for ice cream and could remember the days and times when the ice cream truck would pass by his house. In 2003, the couple headed into town for supplies with Travis in the back seat and the windows partially rolled down. When they got stuck in traffic, a person walking by put an empty soda can in the car and hit Travis flat on his back. Travis unbuckled his seatbelt, unlocked the car doors and chased after the culprit. Travis, however, could not catch up. He then knuckle-walked to the tarmac and began rolling on his stomach. Traffic came to a halt. Drivers and locals were left to enjoy the humorous chase. Travis skidded and jumped over cars, smiling as he evaded a dozen or so police officers who were chasing him. The chase lasted nearly two hours, and a tired Travis finally walked back to his car and fastened his seatbelt. The incident prompted Connecticut authorities to enact a law prohibiting the petting of primates over 50 pounds. Travis was fortunate to be exempt from this rule as he had been owned by the Heralds for a long time, and authorities believed he was not in any danger. Unfortunately, in 2004, a year after the incident, Jerome Herald was battling stomach cancer. Sandra and Travis, who had seen Jerome as the Alpha, were deeply shocked. Sandra was depressed and the home was once again shrouded in sadness, but that was not the only pressing problem. The soon Stamford animal control officers began knocking on her door. Travis had moved into toddlerhood and had now amassed enough strength to rival five muscular men. He tended to be aggressive, especially during puberty, which meant that he was difficult for Sandra to control and harmful to him. Animal control officials advised Sandra that it was not practical to keep the chimp, who had never shown signs of aggression or violence, uh, for the next several years. Sandra resented her husband for carrying a gun. Sandra fell into a state of depression, and all social activity and communication ceased. She spent her days rocking back and forth in a chair by the garden, watching the sunset. Her unstable and vulnerable state had a profound effect on Travis, who spent his days watching TV and eating snacks. Never stepping out of the house and rarely moving his body, Travis found himself 240 pounds overweight. His once shiny face had darkened and was covered in wrinkles. His chest had lost hair and had gone from muscular to flabby. And on Sunday, February 15th, 2009, Sandra called her close friend, Charlotte Nash, and invited her to join them for a chat. 
Sandra and Charla had been friends for many years, and she was a frequent visitor to the Herald's home. Travis knew Charla. Since they had met her many times, they left Travis behind and headed to the Mohegan Sun Casino. They first had their hair done at the salon and then headed to dinner. Then they enjoyed some gambling before heading home and stepping into the house. Sandra was different. She noticed that Travis had no interest in ice cream, which he loved. The TV and computer were both turned off, which was odd considering how much Travis loved the show. The next morning, February 16th, 2009, Sandra mixed a cup of chimpanzee tea before going to bed. Sandra woke up to find Travis wandering aimlessly around the yard. She tried to call him home, but he ignored her. Uh, something was wrong. She immediately called Charla and informed her of Travis's behavior. Uh, without hesitation, Charla got into her car and rushed to Sandra's house. As she got out of the car, she picked up Travis's favorite toy, a red tickle me Elmer. They went out into the yard, confident in their ability to handle Travis. But when he saw his favorite toy, it was as if Travis now had an intense possessive desire for his favorite toy. Travis lunged forward and threw Charla to the ground. Then he stood over her and used his massive jaws to sink his teeth into her face. As Travis's jaws tightened, Charla let out a chilling scream that echoed through this neighborhood. Travis ripped her lips, nose, and eyelids apart. Sandra quickly grabbed a shovel and hit Travis repeatedly, but he was unstoppable. Travis continued to bite, completely destroying the skeleton of Charla's face. Sandra returned to the house, grabbed a knife, and ran outside to help her friend. Travis was so engrossed in his rampage that he did not notice Sandra approaching him as fast as she could. Sandra stuck the knife into the chimpanzee's back and stepped back. Travis stopped tearing at Charla and glared at Sandra with eyes wild with anger. He then turned to Charla and continued to beat her as if nothing had happened. As Travis bit off her left hand, Charla heard the sound of her own bones breaking. She screamed, Travis, don't do this! But seeing Travis's ferocity and thinking that he was next, Travis went into a frenzy. Sandra got into her car and locked all the doors. Her hands trembling with fear, her heart pounding in her chest. She searched for her cell phone, dialed 911, and left it to the police from there. Send the police! What's the problem there? The chip killed my friend! What's the problem with your friend? I need to know. Okay, I need you to calm down a little bit. They're on the way. Wait, hurry up! He's killing our girlfriend! 241 Rock Raymond Road, they're saying someone has a gun is trying to kill somebody. Hurry up! They're on the way, but I need you to give me more information. Who's doing this? Which gun? Who has the gun? Now bring the gun! You gotta kill us, Kim! Kim! What's the problem there? I need you to talk to me. I need you to calm down. Why do you need somebody there? What? Please, Gus. What is the problem? He's killing my friend. Who's killing your friend? Dead, my chimpanzee. She's dead. She's dead. Why Why are you saying that she's dead? She's dead. He ripped her apart. He ripped what apart? Her face? My, everything. Let's go home. Oh, my God. Sandra felt her heart catch in her throat as she watched Charla lying unconscious. Officer Frank Jeffrey, the first responder to the 911 call, found Travis walking around the yard as Charla lay unconscious with her tattered clothes covered in her own blood. He found Travis walking around in the yard. Furious, Travis circled the police car looking for an open door. Inside the car, Officer Frank was scared to death as the 240-pound chimpanzee broke the passenger window and unlocked the door. The officer fired four shots at Travis. The wounded chimpanzee staggered into the house and died on his bed. In the months that followed, Charla underwent multiple surgeries to restore her distorted face. Her left hand had been torn off, as had three fingers of her right hand. Her injuries were so severe that the medical team caring for her had to undergo trauma counseling to treat her. Travis's toxicology report revealed that he had been given a drug that may have fueled his aggression. Some have also suggested that Charla had changed the color and curl of her hair so that she could not see that she was holding Travis's favorite doll which may have frightened Travis. Whatever the cause of Travis's attack, Charla still lives with the trauma and scars. St. James and LaDonna met in West Covina, California, where they became high school sweethearts and dated for several years. 
Despite the mounting pressure around them to finally tie the knot, they stalled their holy matrimony. St. James, a NASCAR driver and car enthusiast, felt that marriage would interfere with his pursuit of his passion. But in 1966, he succumbed to the pressure and the marriage was consummated in a small brick church in the same town where they met. Unfortunately, the tall, handsome NASCAR driver broke into a cold sweat and did not show up for the wedding. Instead, he spent his time tinkering with cars with his one true love. Meanwhile, LaDonna was left behind in the church, embarrassingly alone with friends and relatives. St. James could not have thought of a better way to get the entire neighborhood on his side. Resentment. For the next few years, he became the talk of the town. The mere mention of his name caused bitterness in everyone. Folks, find a way to escape the town's wrath. St. James found what he saw in a newspaper ad. A merchant ship was looking for additional crew for a long voyage. More importantly, the company was willing to pay all expenses. An unexpected and life-changing event happened to him on his journey. It was the event that led to his lifelong love affair and tragic downfall. The ship was forced to land in Tanzania due to a malfunction. St. James spent several days there and became acquainted with Tanzanian hunters on a forest hunt. The Tanzanian hunters killed a female chimpanzee after giving birth and left the newborn to fend for itself. Witnessing this scene, St. James felt sorry for them. St. James decided to take care of that chimpanzee. It was a difficult journey home, but St. James found a few German missionaries who helped him secure a flight back to Los Angeles. At this time, the chimpanzee was already his son. When he arrived at the airport, it was still his mother who greeted him. LaDonna was burning with anger and despair. After all, St. James had not seen her since their wedding day. In addition to her anger, LaDonna couldn't help but notice that something was wrong with St. James. Instead of luggage, he was carrying a baby chimpanzee. Things were awkward between LaDonna and St. James. However, it was most of their life together that helped to settle LaDonna's resentment. Sure enough, LaDonna, his mother, and Esther, who were close friends, soon fell in love. Uh, so did LaDonna. And on June 6, 1970, they got back together. St. James and LaDonna became Mr. and Mrs. Davis in a small ceremony. Mo served as best man. It was the beginning of an unconventional but happy family. But tragic news seldom comes at an opportune time. A year after their marriage, LaDonna was diagnosed with cancer. To make matters worse, her desire to be a mother required a hysterectomy. LaDonna was devastated. She wanted to divorce St. James, and she was ashamed that she could not marry a child. But St. James simply replied, We already have a child. We already have a child. As LaDonna sobbed on St. James's shoulder, Moore quietly sat down in a chair. Mo sat quietly in his chair and looked at the couple. From then on, he became their child, a child who was never quite human, but he was complicated as well. The Davises were sometimes surprised by the range of emotions expressed as the years passed. Tragedy seeped into their lives. One day in August 1998, a welder came to fix Moore's cage, but he left behind a device to give Moore an electric shock, which frightened Moore so much that he ran away. After being missing for several hours, the Davises were forced to call the police. However, by the time Moore was found, he had already dented a police car and injured an officer. A year later, a visitor came to see Mo. Despite being told not to put her hand in the cage, the woman did. As a result, Mo bit her fingertips. He mistook her red fingernail for licorice, his favorite candy. This was the coup de grace. And the intervening West Covina officials considered Moore a danger to the city. Officers armed with tranquilizer guns arrived at Davis' house and attempted to take Moore away, but he resisted. St. James squirmed and was pinned to the ground. Seeing that his father was hurt, Moore screamed wildly and slammed his limbs into the cage. The police swarmed Moore and shot him in the stomach with a dart gun. They then threw the unconscious chimpanzee into a horse trailer. Far from the cozy cage he knew, the dream unleashed itself. The St. James and LaDonna could do nothing. What followed were years of trials and publicity. In 2000, St. James and LaDonna succeeded in transferring Moore to Animal Haven Ranch. But on Moe's 39th birthday, a truly horrifying incident swooped into the Davises' lives on the sunny morning of March 3rd, 25, when they were forced to leave their home and go to the Animal Haven Ranch to find a new home for more. For the second time, St. James and LaDonna checked the items in their car. 
They looked through the piles of toys, balloons, and gifts, and worried that they had missed something. They brought a white sheet cake with raspberry filling. It was Moore's birthday, after all. The St. James took the wheel and LaDonna rode shotgun. They pulled into the driveway and headed for Animal Haven Ranch, a three-hour drive, but they were used to it, knowing their son was waiting for them. It made the trip all the more worthwhile. St. James hurriedly pulled into an open space near the entrance and picked up a small carton of chocolate milk. He got out of the car and walked quickly toward Moore. LaDonna followed suit with a smile. When she brought the cake, Moore clapped his hands and howled loudly. He may not have known it was his birthday, but he knew his parents loved him. LaDonna lowered the cake, cut a few slices, and gave them to St. James and then to Mo. It was a picture-perfect family reunion, but a few feet away from LaDonna, something sinister was happening. A young, male adult chimpanzee had exited his cage and was slowly creeping toward them. LaDonna's eyes locked with the creature. The chimpanzee stood proudly, its chest puffed out and its upper body stronger than the males on full display. The chimpanzee decided to charge. The eerie silence of the park erupted into chaos as the chimpanzee ran toward his wife to the horrified screams of LaDonna. St. James rushed to the rescue as the two animals approached. The chimpanzee approached LaDonna and struck her in the back. The chimpanzee knocked LaDonna into St. James's arms and locked her in his powerful jaws. The chimpanzee yanked on LaDonna's thumb and pulled her fingers out like potatoes. The chimpanzee went for LaDonna's head, but St. James shoved her under the picnic table. LaDonna screamed and tried to order the chimpanzee to stop and submit, but it was no use. Chimps in the wild may have resembled a mall, but blocking a rampaging chimpanzee was not made from the same cloth. St. James braced himself to face the wrath of this creature. However, the six-foot-one former running back did not expect another chimpanzee to come running toward him. The chimpanzee was large and looked older. His heart sank, and St. James let out an ungainly scream as hard as he could. He pushed the large chimpanzee away, but the chimpanzee pounced on his back, followed by the smaller chimpanzees. One of the chimps thrust its mighty jaws into St. James's face, shattering the bone above his brow. It then thrust its fingers into his eye sockets and gouged out his eyeballs. The wild chimpanzee bit off St. James's nose, chewed off his fingers and sliced him up some more. It tore the lips of the skin off his face and shredded it, and most of his teeth. Finally, as he lay helpless on the ground, they bit off his buttocks and began biting his genitals. He was castrated and covered in blood. LaDonna had no choice but to scream. Eventually it reached Mark Carruthers, the rancher's son-in-law. He armed himself with a revolver and ran toward the commotion. He shot the young little chimpanzee, but it had no effect. Mark quickly returned home and picked up a more powerful gun. Mark pointed the gun at the larger chimpanzee and fired at its head. The chimpanzee's brain exploded and it fell to the ground. Mark aimed at the chimpanzee's chest and fired another shot. When paramedics arrived, the chimpanzee instantly collapsed and fell onto St. James's back. St. James was not a sight to be seen. His face was a bloody mass with holes in it. There was a lot of his blood at the scene. Even the paramedics could not believe the brutality. Chimpanzees are capable of that. Doctors put the chimpanzee in a coma and then reconstructed his face through dozens of surgeries. Subsequent investigation revealed that one of the shelter's owners had accidentally left the chimpanzee's cage open. St. James, however, became completely dependent on LaDonna in the aftermath, but the two still visited Moore on a regular basis. Unfortunately, tragedy did not stay with the Davies family. In 2000, St. James went missing after escaping from his cage. A massive search was immediately conducted. However, no trace of Moore was found. Weeks, weeks, months, and years of blood searching, Mo was never found. St. James and LaDonna just had to wait. They still hold out hope that they might see more again someday. Uh, today, the Davises' lives revolve around taking care of St. James. St. James was severely scarred by Moore's attack, but he is suffering from an invisible wound. I could talk about Moore for days. I miss him so much. I've never loved anything more. I have cared for Mo for 30 years. Somehow Mr. and Mrs. Davis must find a way to live without him. For St. James, his life will never be the same. The following story is considered one of the most brutal and horrific chimpanzee attacks in recorded history. It takes place in the tropical jungles of Sierra Leone, a verdant paradise. 
A great variety of plants and wildlife thrive here, but one day war breaks out, bringing with it an unprecedented demand for land, fuel and resources. The chimpanzees of Sierra Leone suffered the harshest consequences as war ravaged the picturesque landscape they once called home. Previously, there was a thriving community of chimpanzees with a population of approximately 30,000 individuals bound together by enduring family ties. However, habitat destruction and ruthless killing by the inhabitants of the jungle areas have drastically reduced this population to only a few thousand. These soldiers usually killed adult chimpanzees only to kidnap the young and sell them off as pets on the local black market. For this reason, several animal rights activists called for the construction of a sanctuary to protect the now endangered chimpanzees from the vile greed and incessant barbarism of humans. The Taku Gama Chimpanzee Sanctuary is one such sanctuary located near the capital of Sierra Leone. The sanctuary has provided shelter for orphaned and traumatized chimpanzees for nearly 30 years. The abused chimpanzees who have taken refuge at the sanctuary were traumatized by years of abuse by soldiers during the war. For the majority of the chimpanzees, the slaughter of their families was their first exposure to humans. Some had their teeth knocked out or were locked in cramped cages for days. They were even forced to consume alcohol for human entertainment, which is considered a major tourist attraction. Visitors from around the world come to Takugama to shed light on the impact and cruelty of human expansion on local wildlife. In 2006, Ellen Robertson, Gary Brown and Richie Goody were subcontractors working on the construction of the U.S. Embassy building in Sierra Leone. When the opportunity arose to visit the Takugama Chimpanzee Sanctuary, an exciting proposal from their friend and local guide, Melvin Mama, was unanimously approved by the four and they hailed a cab and began their journey to Takugama. On Sunday, April 23rd, the cab drove 30 minutes down the mountain slope. We were on our way to Takugama. The four of them admired the stunning countryside while Melvin told an interesting story about the country's rich history. Little did they know as their vehicle crested the final hill into the 100-acre reserve. On the other side of the front gate, things had gone horribly wrong. While workers inside the reserve were feeding the chimpanzees, a group of chimpanzees suddenly became enraged and escaped through the electrified fence surrounding the property. This incident set off one of the most brutal and gruesome chimpanzee attacks in recorded history. The chimps went on a rampage, tearing apart anyone unlucky enough to cross their path. The newly formed chimpanzee herd consisted of 31 young adults and was led by a chimpanzee known as Bruno. Bruno a 270-pound, six-foot-tall alpha male had been taken from his mother as a child and suffered severe trauma. After witnessing his entire family slaughtered by humans, he was later sold on the black market for only $1.30. In chimpanzee culture, it is not always the large, aggressive males that lead the pack. Instead, the elders of the park choose a suitable leader, even if a particularly powerful male has defeated and subjugated all of his rivals. The Chimpanzee Elder Society may not give him the blessing of leadership. The Chimpanzee Alpha has the onerous responsibility of taking care of the entire herd and, if necessary, protecting the entire herd down to the weakest members. Aside from being the undisputed Alpha, Bruno was a huge chimpanzee by any standards. He easily outclassed all the other members of the herd. Bruno seemed to harbor a deep hatred for humans despite the kindness he was later shown by the reserve staff. That hatred was quickly encountered when four men in a canoe with a driver waiting in the vehicle came upon a closed fence that was meant to prevent unannounced visitors. They honked their horns in hopes that someone would come out and open the gate, but the sound of the car horn drew the attention of the one thing the men least wanted to see that morning. Bruno. Bruno soon emerged from deep in the forest with his loyal, bloodthirsty followers in tow. The chimps immediately surrounded the cab, screaming and banging on doors and windows, while the group watched in horror from inside. Bruno was so large that the group initially mistook him for a gorilla, but soon realized they were in danger. Yes, they put the car in reverse and stepped on the gas pedal as hard as they could. When the car suddenly jumped backwards, Bruno gave chase and easily overtook the speeding car. He jumped onto the hood of the car and yelled angrily, showing his terrifyingly sharp teeth. As the car continued to roll downhill, he began banging on the hood and windshield in an attempt to get inside the car. 
Bruno shifted his aim to the rear windshield of the car and pounced on Melvin through the glass. Bruno bit Melvin's hand and shook his head violently, tearing flesh and bone, causing Melvin to scream in pain. Melvin struggled to resist with the help of his friends, but Bruno was too strong. Desperate to escape his predicament, Melvin instructed the ESA to put the car in forward gear. As he did so, the car suddenly stopped and veered off in an unexpected direction. Bruno, whose sharp teeth were digging into Melvin's arm as hard as they could, was caught off guard by the sudden change of motion and sent flying backwards out the same window through which he had entered. Alan and Gary grabbed Melvin's legs just as he was about to be dragged completely out of the car by Bruno, and the two men began to hoist him up into the car. Melvin's fear and disbelief were replaced by pain. The attack wore off. Almost half of his hand and three fingers were gone. Gary tried to calm Melvin down, ripping the cloth from his shirt and wrapping his hands in a drooping mass of skin. Issa was beginning to lose his grip with fear and anxiety. His mind began to take over. He was a local from Sierra Leone and knew what chimpanzees could do. He saw hordes of chimpanzees and the ocean tearing humans apart in a matter of seconds. He was going to crash through the gate while the other chimps begged him to slow down. Eventually, he reached top speed and the car was loaded with heavy metal gates. The sheer force of the crash knocked everyone unconscious. Gary was awakened by Melvin's screams. Gary looked around the deserted car and realized that it was empty and he was alone. When Gary looked in the direction of the screams, he saw Bruno dragging a helpless Melvin out of the car and a vicious horde had begun to attack Melvin. Gary, who was determined to save his friend, got out of the car picked up a sharp wooden log and shouted angrily in an attempt to distract Bruno's attention from Melvin. Many chimpanzees in the wild avoid direct confrontation with humans, even if the chimpanzees are physically much stronger. The natural posture of humans appears tall and intimidating to chimpanzees. However, domesticated chimpanzees, or at least those that have spent most of their lives among humans, like Bruno, quickly realized the physical advantage they had over humans in both strength and agility. Standing up to the challenge, Bruno began to charge toward Gary, standing on his hind legs to appear taller and waving his arms with a thump. Bruno was easily overpowered by the six-foot-tall man. Gary was only five feet nine inches tall, but Gary remained calm as the beast leaped at him. Gary raised his weapon and struck Bruno in the neck, knocking him down. Oh, Bruno tried to get up, but Gary would not let him. Bruno's pack froze and Gary hit him again and again with the wooden log. Bruno, who then gave up and became more submissive to Gary, retreated into the forest and disappeared. Witnessing their leader's defeat, the horde of angry chimpanzees grew even quieter and after their victory, disappeared into the forest from which they had come. Gary turned his attention to Melvin and tried to get Melvin to his feet. Melvin could no longer stand on his own. It seemed that Bruno had bitten off most of his right leg when he saw that the horde was gone. Gary told Melvin that he was going to look for help as he crossed the unfamiliar forest. Eventually, he ran into Richie and Alan. He instructed them to go look for help while he tended to Melvin himself. Before they left, however, they realized that Issa was nowhere to be seen. Richie told Gary that after Issa's failed attempt to break through the sanctuary's metal gate, he got out of the car and climbed over the gate, leaving the rest of them to fend for themselves. He headed for the main road. Gary nodded in disappointment and warned the two men to be vigilant and watch their backs. When he returned to Melvin, he wrapped a cloth around Melvin's right leg to stop the bleeding. Melvin leaned on Gary's back for support, and the two headed toward the main road. Apparently, Richie and Alan had reached a military patrol and informed the soldiers of their location. A military vehicle soon picked them up and rushed Melvin to a nearby medical facility. Gary breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that Melvin and the others were safe, but he still couldn't fully process the events of this terrible day, still in disbelief. Gary, Melvin, Richie, and Alan all made it back alive, but a much crueler fate awaited Issa. His jaws, gutted, were so mangled that they were indistinguishable. A horde of angry chimpanzees seemed to have caught up with him, carrying all the limbs from his body before feasting on his remains. Bruno, on the other hand, was never found, but 27 of the 31 escaped chimpanzees were eventually recovered. Bruno was one of the four that were not recovered. Numerous attempts were made to locate Bruno and bring him back. Many attempts to locate and retrieve Bruno were unsuccessful. This was despite the fact that sightings of Bruno were regularly reported. To this day, Bruno continues to elude his pursuers. 
it is as if he has developed a sense of warning that he is being pursued by humans. Considering all the abuse he has suffered because of humans, this group will never forget that he was near death in the forests of Sierra Leone. Uh, Gary, in particular, was plagued with nightmares for months after that horrible incident. He considers himself lucky to have been able to fight off Bruno and rescue Melvin. He is grateful to have made it to safety. Unlike Isa, who was ambushed by this savage beast and suffered his final agony with cries of terror. <laughs>